Welcome to this next episode of the Beloved Miracles Couples Project. Today I'm reaching in two directions from where I'm at here in Norway, east to Tel Aviv, Israel. Hello, Hoya. <laughs> Hello, Timothy. <laughs> I had a little problem there with the mute button. <laughs> We're both pushing your mute button at the same oh, time. Oh, okay. That's what it was. I'm... <laughs> Fantastic, man. Hang on there. And hello, Tracy, reaching west to Atlanta, Georgia, USA. Hey, Tim. How are you? I'm doing great, guys. I'm just thrilled to be here with you. I might get a little tired reaching so far in both directions, but we're going to make this work because the story that you guys have to share individually and collectively is one that everyone's going to want to hear. So let me do a brief introduction. Um, the notable entrepreneur, Tracy Walker, shared her story with us just last week. In that interview, she revealed Hoya. Hoya is a young, enthusiastic entrepreneur bringing health back to the community in body, mind, and spirit. So let's pick up the story there. Hoya, where does your story begin? Well, um, a small town south of Israel called Demona. That's where my story began. And um, 18 years of living down there, um, I went into the military, which is um, something similar to college time in, in the States or anywhere else in the world. You know, so military is mandatory here. And you have, uh, for guys it's three years and for girls it's two. That's what we really call like the thinking time. So what are you going to do after the military? You know, usually people be like, what are you going to do after school or college? You're going to. So we have the military time as well to think about what we're going to do with our lives. So um, military time. Oh, man. Going back in my mind, thinking about that time is, is a serious. Um, it does something to me because it was that period of time that was to make me or break me. Right, um, had many situations, uh, forks in a road, if you will. My mom had a stroke. Um, my dad wasn't living in the country. Uh, my sister got married and moved to the States. Um, literally all of the family weights was on my shoulders. And I'm still in the gym working out. <laughs> so, um, yeah, that's that's kind of where my story began. <laughs> so, I mean, if you have more questions on that, I can go deeper for you. I mean, I guess I'm still wondering where you were. You born? Were you born stateside? Yes, I was born in Demona, Israel. Okay, but you yeah, have, we have um, you mentioned in uh, in Chicago as well. Can you weave that together in terms of kind of a, t a, bit, a bit more of a timeline just so we have some sense of where you were when? Running back on a timeline, my grandparents come from, my mother's side is Chicago, my father's side is New Jersey. And um, in the late 60s, they joined a um, Hebrew Israelite group to reconnect themselves back to their homeland. So by the way of Liberia, where my mother was born, um, they came to Israel. And that's how I was born in Demona, Israel. Me and about another five to 10,000 people. <laughs> when people think that there aren't any black people in Israel. Because all of the Israelis give us the same thing. They say, well, you speak English so well, like you were born in America. I said, no, this is right down south, Demona, like the driest city in the world. That's where we're from. But they like, no, Chicago? No, we're like, no, we're from here. Like, our Hebrew tongue is just as great as yours. <laughs> so we get that all the time. Okay, so to finish the picture in my mind, you're born in Israel, and then did you, did you, you lived most of your childhood there, or did you do some traveling? I lived my entire childhood in Israel. I left Israel for the first time when I was... Um, 16 or 17 is the first time I went out to the States to visit my father. He had moved, he had separated from my mom before and moved out to the States. So me and two other brothers, 
took a um, flight to the States to visit my, my dad. So that was the first time and on and off since 2006, I've been back and forth to the States. Um, the last time was 2014, I went out there as an entrepreneur um, seeking mentorship and opportunity on a new level. And I, I, I did about two years in Atlanta. Got it. Okay. So this is a key to the entrepreneurial journey. So yeah, pick it up from there. Like, like how did that begin in the States and then you're in Israel now? So what did you bring back? And of course you're sitting in a very special place right now too. So fill us in, <laughs> fill us in uh, bring us current in the timeline. Well, family was blessed. Um, my dad always loved to uh, bake and he was an entrepreneur himself. He, Put himself to um, flight school. He, he became a pilot. He built cars. Um, you name it, my daddy did it. <laughs> so he always taught us, you know, if you want something, go out and get it. And from a very young age, I had that entrepreneur spirit. He built the family of bakery, and we still have that bakery today. We wouldn't have it because we did lose it a few times. However, um, through the grace of God, we, we, we have that as a family. It's, it's more of a nation business today. It's not just a family business because we serve a nation of people and not just a community, but a nation, a vegan nation. We have many tourists that come down through there and get the um, get to, to, to sample the food, but get the story behind the place. The story, the story behind the place is more important than the food itself, you know? Um, the bakery was built because we didn't have anywhere to buy vegan bread from, you know. You had to, all the bread had eggs in it. It's like bread was made with eggs and it, it, you know, bread wasn't vegan first. But bread was vegan first. You know, in the original state before we added eggs and before we changed the recipes and, you know, conform to society today, the, the bread was vegan. So we had to bring that back. That's the whole bringing health back to the community. That's where it ties up. You know, when I met Tracy, I mean, such a wonderful person, right? But when I met her, she told me, she said, um, I don't have a problem trying veganism or born vegan or whatever. She said, I just don't know where to start. And I told her, I said, listen, love, let me handle the kitchen. You do, you, you're amazing where you are. Just let me handle the kitchen. If you don't cook then you you don't have a problem if you don't go in the kitchen but to eat then you're good and she started and she was in israel for um about 10 days and she she maintained a vegan um daily lifestyle within those days and she, did you enjoy the food babe <laughs> i did i i actually was uh, surprise. I don't know what I thought vegan was going to taste like or all I knew is what it didn't have. And uh, my perception of what those ingredients bring to food, the fact that now that wasn't in the food, I conjured up my own idea of what I thought that was going to taste like. Um, but there's so many, what I learned is that there's so many natural alternatives to the things that that we know that all the food, I mean, his mom cooked every day um, for the most part. And um, we ate, you know, breakfast, dinner. Um, we had some, I think we had a lunch in there a couple of times, but, but um, I wasn't worried about meat or like, I didn't, like, I need some eggs. That was not an issue. <laughs> um, I didn't really say, hey, you got to take me to the store. I got to have cheese. I got to, none of that was even really a factor. I, we were in Tel Aviv one point and um, I was like, look, I'm hungry. And um, me, Hoya, and his one of his younger brothers were kind of just out and they took me to this little spot like on the corner in like the district, the nightlife. And it was a vegan sandwich place where they it's not vegan, but they had vegan options at this place. And um, I got me like what I would consider like a sub sandwich, <laughs> but with vegan meat in it and all the different sauces and stuff. So it was really, really good. And it was at that time when I came back to the States that I decided I was just going to not eat meat uh, anymore. And so. Um, he knows it's a process. I would, I def, I'm not vegan, right? Because here, I mean, there's just, you know, I'm not making my own bread here, right? I'm just going to get the bread. So there's still milk and eggs and cheese and stuff. Um, 
And so I'm not vegan, but um, I have at least started the process of eliminating the meat. Uh, and that's that's where I am. So it was a great experience. I, I don't miss I don't miss any of that stuff, actually, anymore. Fantastic. So Hoya, you were born and raised with that uh, diet. Would that be fair to say? Or did you also make a switch at some point? I was born and raised with that mindset and that, that um, we don't call it a diet. We call it a lifestyle because it's not a diet. This is not a practice for a month or a week or even a year. If you don't continue to maintain the vehicle that you were given to run across this earth and do whatever God put you here to do, then you won't be here very long. Your mission will be cut short. So when I understood that, and I didn't understand that, you know, from the beginning, of course, I've, I've seen my friends go astray from the lifestyle, you know, choose their lifestyle, which is different than the one we grew up on. And everybody has a choice, but I wanted to study. This is my mission two years in the States and being in different other um, islands and other parts of the world just to study their, um, their lifestyles. You know, being a chef, you want to go to different countries and understand different, you know, different facets of life and how they how how they how they how they uh, introduce their cuisine, if you will. So I picked up um, I picked up some Thai, some Vietnamese, some uh, Jamaican, some uh, just so many different cultures, Ethiopian, um, different types and different cultures. I even, I, I've sent Tracy to one of my um, African chefs and she makes some amazing food. I mean, a woman will talk you probably and, and, until you leave her house, she, she, you know, she don't save her words, but she's very sweet and her food is amazing. <laughs> I've often had this phrase when I eat in a restaurant that uh, I can taste the love and the food. And I think I'm hearing you describe that in your way, right? I mean, that you can literally taste not just the physical food, but you can taste the energy, right? Like homemade, handmade bread, even when I make it myself, this is a whole, it's not comparable to the stuff I buy in the store, right? Which is usually machine uh, kneaded dough and all that stuff. This is true, Timothy, because I'm, I'm a chef and <clears throat> Technically, I haven't been certified by any of the worldly schools except the, the college that I went to in Israel just to learn basics. But um, I have been certified by um, our very own School of the Prophets, which is the college within our community. And I never thought recipes or cake or anything of that sort was so important. <laughs> I mean, it, it is important. You said, you, said a, you said a major thing when you spoke of love being an ingredient in food. You could take a recipe off the internet, but you can't, you, can't, you can't just add, you can't take the love off the internet and put it into it. You get what I'm saying? That, that has to come from another, another place. And that's, some, that's an ingredient that another chef just can't. You know, they, they, they just can't swipe that inside their menu. Yeah, exactly. So I'm still left a little bit with the timeline that you shared. You were in the military. I heard all this change, this transition, the, the weight of it all. You talked about still being in the gym. Um, <laughs> did you have the vision to, to, to work with food then? Or was it even earlier because your family was already in that business? You know, so, with, yeah. with the bakery, you, you knew that this was the path for you to walk? I did know that this was the path for me to walk. I didn't want it. I wanted to, my dad flew a plane, so I first thought that I might want to sell a boat because my dad flew a plane, so I had to be extreme. You know, none, none of my friends were selling boats, so I was like, okay, dad flew a plane, either I'll fly a plane or sell a boat. But I forgot that dad built the bakery first, <laughs> and he had planned something for us to do. I tried to get out of this bakery with my heart, <laughs> but my rightful place is owning a bakery or food business. I mean, I have it at ease. I know the business. 
within six months, we were blessed to lift this um, vegan deli, the taste of life. And hadn't it been for all that experience, 10,000 hours in the bakery and in the food business, we wouldn't have been able to do that. Got so, it. Yeah, I um, was in the military. I used to wa watch a show called uh, Cake Boss. Oh, yeah. I know that yeah, show. Yeah, a lot of people watch that show. It's a, you know, um, a bakery in New Jersey. And I was in New Jersey, but I didn't get a chance to go to the, the bakery yet. However, he inspired me to combine my artistic mind with my bacon talent. And as I did that, I began to really understand and like the field that I was in. Before, I was doing it because my mom, she had a stroke. I had to feed my brothers. I had to pay tuition. I had to deal with the family bills. I had to deal with the bakery bills, which I didn't know what bills were as a teenager. You know, $10,000. I mean, to, to, to most teens, that's a lot of money. 10,000 shekels, if you will. This is Israel, so the currency is different. But... um. I had the weight of my small world at that time on my shoulders. I didn't know how to deal with things. So um, being inspired by um, Cake Boss, I, did, I never knew that I would be baking cakes. I didn't, that wasn't my, my dream was just to get puff pastry vegan so I can make vegan, puff, vegan pastries, croissants, um, apple turnovers, cinnamon rolls, and these sorts. And I would go to the, through the bus station every morning as I'm on my way to, to work or to the base, and I'm like, I, I must get my pastries. And back then, I, I used to call my pastries war pastries because by 5 o'clock in the evening, you could throw one across the room and it would kill somebody. So, you know, I mean, Chef Hoya, I, <laughs> if you take me all the way back, I got to – funny story as well you know everybody starts somewhere so yeah war pastries was it's probably going to be a line of my pastries you know in the future if they make it to some of the big box stores so you can understand what war pastries are <laughs> <laughs> we all should have an experience of that for sure right i mean that seems to fit even with the the whole world scene right now that there ought to be something we can bite on and throw around the room as you say yeah yeah. <laughs> so fill us in. I mean, like you now have have taken that childhood, taken taken the difficulties, the tastes, and the war uh, pastries, and you've created something now, right? The taste of life, a vegan deli. Like, like why that, and why that name, and and I I've seen on one of your live streams some hints at a vision of of how big that you believe this has a destiny to grow. So paint that picture for us. Like, where are you at now? What is, what's that scene you're sitting in? And what do you see it being the start of? Well, first of all, I want to give honor to my forefathers and pioneers because I would be remiss if I take this credit alone. I didn't build anything. I am a part of a team that has... Um, been working on this project for for nearly 50 years, if you will. Um, my, my grandparents have been vegan for about 50 years now, and they started this. The Taste of Life is theirs. Um, yes, they, they did struggle because the financial era changed, and they didn't know how to adapt to, to that financial era. But the Taste of Life originally was a holistic facility to um, nurture vegans and those who want to um, incorporate veganism into their lives. So once again, the, those from the community and Demona would come out to Tel Aviv, which is a big city, and they would work jobs, but they wouldn't have food because veganism back 50 and 40 years ago, nobody was really talking about veganism. So we needed a location for our people to be able to come, those that are coming in the country and those that are coming and working in Tel Aviv, they could take care of themselves as far as the meals and, and, and you know, make it through the day and through the week. So this is, this is a, um, an extension of a restaurant that was open for 32 years. 
So I can't take the full credit. Yeah, the Taste of Life, the deli style, it's just a, it's just a new version of what they started. And with this model, we can copy and paste this all around the world. And the demand for that is growing, isn't it? As far as I know right now, you it's know. It's already there. More people are conscious today. The world is a better place today. A lot of people say the world is, man, that's a crazy world out there. No, no it's not. If you talk to the people, <laughs> the people that actually care about themselves, the people that actually want to know what's going on in their body, the people that actually get on the flights, even from the rival countries, you know, you, you talk to the people, they're lovely people. Now, if you talk to the news and everybody that's controlling the people and the voice of the people, then they, their opinion may be different. But yeah, people are conscious. You know, you want to grow the food. You, when, when Tracy was in a bakery and saw that we made bread from scratch, I saw her eyes light up. And I'm like, yeah, in America, they don't do this. I'm sorry. <laughs> you could almost never get this again because it's everything is commercial. Everything is factory. Everything is quick, fast, and in a hurry. Some things need to be done slow. <laughs> you know, some things need time. Bread needs time to rise. It needs time to sit. You know, this food, this food that we have on the line here, by the way, let me show you just so you know what I'm talking about. Um, in fact, we, we have had some complaints. We're not perfect, and we're still working everything out. This is my hot bar line, and um, we have a salad bar here. So sometimes we may have a complaint where a customer bought something back because it was, it was no longer good. And we tell our customers, this stuff is freshly made. You know, this, is, this has no preservatives. Everything in it is alive. So you live, you know. Um, I believe that live food keeps you alive. So you should not cook the food dead. You know, yeah, we fry food. We're young. We like to fry food. But we have different items in here or even uh, juices in here to help with that. If you're going to eat fried foods, juice once a week, you know, cleanse your body, get it back to its natural state because fried food is good. I love fried food. <laughs> but you have to balance everything. And I just wanted to say, um, as, as Hoya was showing you guys around um, the deli, um, A, I was over in Israel before they opened up. Right. So they were still building everything out. The construction phase was still happening. It was dust everywhere. They were putting the floors down, hammers and nails and things like that. Right. Um, and he also um, you heard him say earlier, combining his artistic mind with, you know, his ability to um, to be on the culinary side of things. A lot of the decor that you see, like there's right to his right. Well, to me, it's his right. Um, like he he made that. <laughs> that mirror there. And if you look through the mirror, you can see the other wall back there, that little clock on that, on that cabinet. Like he made that, all that stuff at the top, like all that decor is his eye. It's, it's his hand, it's his vision, all of that stuff. Right. So um, it's not just the food, it's the environment, it's the place. I, I really think it's um, him and his partner together. I don't, I don't want to take anything from, from him as well, but together, just since we're talking about him, his artistic, like all those art pieces, he draw, he drew all that stuff, right? And he sells that art. Um, so he brings a lot of that to business as well. It's not just about um, the bottom line, which it kind of can be, but it's also about the experience that people have when they're they're a part of him and his business and things like that. Very clear. So, I mean, there's a lot of heart and soul just listening to you and I can almost taste it. And what you showed us as well, looks like some good eats, man, really good looking stuff. Is there, is there more to share of that vision that you want to make sure is like, recorded now we documented you know what you're in the middle of creating and 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 what it will blossom into well um the main thing is to um reach out to the youth and the babies and <clears throat> the young parents because 30 40 years from now if we don't take back what's on our plate, 
then our lives can be shortened to I don't know how many amount of years and that's important you know being wealthy is not just having a million dollars or a billion dollars it's understanding what a billion dollar mindset is a billion dollar a billion dollar mindset is not necessarily having a billion dollars it's being able to manage a billion dollars you know if you have a million employees and they get paid on time every month or every two weeks to take care of their families that's a billion dollar mindset it's not necessarily having the money you know it's not necessarily owning the businesses I could own a hundred locations but if my my team my staff my clients they're not satisfied if the food is spoiled if it's if it's not made with love if it's fried if, if only the fried menu is selling that's a problem with me <laughs> You know, I, I'm not doing my work well enough because I need to figure out how to balance those people that come in just for starch or that don't understand that eating is important. Food is energy. Food is energy. The energy between me and beloved Tracy is um, based off of the first meal in the morning, you know. I mean, depending on what you eat depends on how you how much energy you have to react to whatever you go through in that day. And sometimes you have some rough days. You know, they, they, you have no warning. It's just a rough day. But um, the, the, the lifestyle, and it's not just food. See, I don't want to go too deep into food. Like she said, it's the lifestyle. It's the environment. The colors we chose. The green. <laughs> they have a bus card here that's also green and purple. And one of my staff members, they asked one of the clients, what does this, this color remind you of? They said, the bus cart. <laughs> it, was, it was like one of the greatest jokes. But these colors, symbolically, are royal colors. Green is greenery, it's life, it's promoting health and everything. But the purple is royal. Purple is only kings and queens and... And, and, and the royal families, they wore purple. So we allow everybody to be a part of the royal family. And then the white is, you know, cleanliness, purity, and, and all the great things that light and white, you know, represents. But the purple and the green, these are relaxing colors. When you come in here, you're in a safe environment. When I, I don't, and I don't mean safe from harm. I mean, everything that you touch is going to be healing. So... Um, that's it on the business. I really want to go back more into um, the relationship and uh, my life because that's more important. This business is going to be here. Thank the Lord, we have made it. You know, this is our um, this is the, the the middle of the second month, and we did big. Like everybody supported us. Um, our parents and grandparents, everybody that run up to me trying to get something inside of here. And, you know, I feel like I'm on Shark Tank, but food. <laughs> it's, 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 a, it's an amazing experience because this is something that I wanted. And, and I've had a location that I was subleasing in Atlanta with my partner, which is uh, Tracy's trainer. This is one of my partners in the States. We had a location on Peachtree in Atlanta, but we were subleasing. Now, entrepreneurs will know what subleasing is because if you're a true entrepreneur you, and you get an opportunity to sublease from somebody, you will. And it's one of the most harshest stages in your life it could be if you don't really know how to um, be diplomatic. Subleasing means you, 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 don't, you have no authority, but you do have space. <laughs> So it's like being the little kid in the house. <laughs> you don't have any authority. You don't pay the bills here, but you do have a little space. So if you grow, then one day you'll be able to pay the bills. And we had to learn that. We had um, this guy that owned 20 restaurants in Atlanta. His, his restaurant chain is called Chin Chin. We were, we were blessed to sit down and have a meeting with him when we thought we were ready. We thought we were ready. We, hey, you know, we could do this. We could take it. He came and sat and saw us and said, you know, very cute, you know, very, it's a, it's a nice job. But he said, when you're ready, 
but people will know you're in. You know, your doors won't be open until people are knocking them down. And that's when I knew that I was onto something when I opened up this location because I remembered, I said, a mentor told me, he said, before you open, people need to be begging for you to be open. We sat in this location three, four, five months before we opened the doors. And everybody's posting on Facebook and Instagram and this and that. When are you guys open? We want to know what the taste of life is like. And we closed down the other restaurants, so that was heartbreaking to all of the, the um, regular clients. So um, because the deli does connect back to my personal entrepreneurial life, this is the fun part to tell. You know, The guys, like I said, he owned a restaurant called Chin Chin, Chin Chin. In Atlanta, if you go almost on any and every street, you're going to see at least a Chin Chin. It's about 20 locations. And you can just buy it. We, we had Chin Chin last night. <laughs> yeah. So we love Chin Chin. Yeah. Chin Chin, he taught me a lot in one meeting. He has 20 locations. So, I mean, I'm, you know, this is, this is, a, this is our first um, location here in Israel. And it's my first official location that I am the owner. I am on the business name. I'm not subleasing. I'm, you know, this is not a business where it's within the community, but we're not legally doing business all over the city. You know, this is legal. So um, it was a blessing. And I, I, I knew that, hold on one second. I knew that um, I crossed the entrepreneurial mark into the business owner mark when uh, when that took place. <laughs>